So, uh, as uh, Lionel says, I've been working on many different subjects. I am not so young anymore, so clearly Tage uh, contributed to that. And in, in California, where I am now, is the sun is coming up. And uh, I think in Uruguay now is lunchtime. So I will talk today about FCS, but from the point of view of single molecule. This is my interest. And uh, I start with this slide, which I always show in, at the beginning of my talk, in which you can see a cell. And the cell might be the, you have a dark side, which is the nucleus, because the protein that we are looking doesn't penetrate in the nucleus very much. But the protein aggregates in so-called focal addition. This is Paxil EGFP. So uh, uh, aggregating focal addition. And the question I have is the following. So uh, focal addition forms in terms of might be minutes and uh, involves uh, about a hundred or more diff different molecules. And you have many in the cell. In order for the cell to move a focal addition in the leading part of the cell, so the part that is moving in this direction, will have to disassemble uh, and reassemble again. And all this process is continuously happening. And this is something which happens in very frequently in any biological process. And this is a case in which the focal addition are all different and might be the association of the proteins are different in the, in, 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 in the particular focal addition. So you can have a, a system in which is highly reproducible. So the cells to move needs a focal addition, but the, there is no stoichiometry, specific stoichiometry of how to, in, in this assembly, which is different from many other processes. But the question is, how, how a molecule, which is, for example, in a leading edge, can in part go into the nucleus or in part go in the other side of the cell? So what is the path that the molecule will follow? And I'm, you can see from the very beginning, I put the accent on the word molecule, and I want to, to be, to see if it's possible to follow a molecule. And then in the cell here, you can have a million of molecules, but you want to observe one, one in particular going from one position to another. And uh, there is no super resolution of anything that will uh, be able to give you a single molecule, but we will use this method, which is based on fl uh, fluctuation spectroscopy, in which we can follow single molecules as they go through the cell. Okay, so first of all, let us start so, some introduction. And uh, so molecules in the cell can move uh, in uh, particles, which are moved by motors, but a, a motion, a, which is always universal, is the diffusion of molecules. And diffusion of molecules uh, is a process that took some time to understand, and not necessarily we understand completely, uh, in, and not in a cell, because in a cell there are different kinds of diffusion and motion that we have to take into account. But there are some general rules about diffusion, which I represent here by this graph. I hope you can see my, my, um, um, uh, my uh, mouse. So what is happening is that if you have, for example, all the molecule in a given position, so that indicate the position at a given time, as the time evolves, the distribution of this molecule remain Gaussian according to a fixed second law. And uh, uh, since it, this is a probability, as the curve of the distribution broadens, you can see that the integral has to remain constant because it's a probability. There are many kinds of diffusion. For example, Dave talked about uh, a rotational diffusion, a rotational diffusion which depends on various well. But the main problem is diffusion. And diffusion is a universal um, um, way of molecules to move. Uh, my B is not important for cells or not important for animals. We don't diffuse, or at least we pretend not to diffuse. And, but what is happening is I want to study this mechanism in cells, and in particular in the interior of cells. So where is the name? And where, who was one of the first people studying Brownian motion? And this Brownian comes from Robert Brown, which was an English botanist which about now more than 
200 years ago about, uh, was studying the motion of uh, particles, which are pollen grains, uh, and uh, the idea at that time that was that uh, every form of life, including plants, he was a botanist, uh, start with some sort of uh, seed or some sort of uh, uh, um, molecules or, or, uh, one or um, structure that gives rise to life. And then he says, well, uh, in the animals are sperms or other forms of uh, um, aggregates, but in the plant they have to be the pollen. And then in order to show that pollen is uh, a origin of life, he said, well, if it moves, uh, everything that moves, moves because of, because of, because it's alive. And so he observed under the microscope uh, by eye, because we didn't have any of the beautiful detectors that were well described by Lionel, the motion of the pollen. And the pollen is small enough, and he was observing the motion, so he went to the, uh, he was part of the Royal Academy, and he went to give a talk about the origin of life and the pollen as the origin of life. That was, uh, uh, and uh, because it was moving, he said it moves, so it has to be, uh, um, it has to be alive. And apparently there is a record of his talk and in the record of his talk somebody asked, but how do you know, have you done anything which is inanimate and for sure doesn't move, it's not supposed to move. And uh, he said, of course, you know, if it moves, it has to be animate. Well, uh, in coming back to his lab, uh, he ordered uh, to his uh, assi assistant, to look at the motion of things which are inanimate. And he took a piece of wood, uh, making little pieces and putting them in the microscope, actually the assistant did that, and the piece, little piece of wood were moving. And then uh, that was a surprise and uh, for, for Robert Brown, and Robert Brown said, well, might be because they're alive. And then uh, there is a record that he ordered very, very old wood from the uh, pyramids in, in Egypt, which were 6,000 year old, and they say they have to be uh, dead, and, uh, and they were moving. And so everything that he has observed was moving, uh, and, and so that today is known as the Brownian motion, which is affecting every object, uh, uh, and the explanation of the uh, Brownian motion come from um, Albert Einstein, actually Albert Einstein never did an experiment, but he was able to give an explanation about the, um, this motion. And uh, he knew, of course, theories of gases. And uh, he used the explanation why molecules and gases move, and, but applied to a liquid, to a solid. And here I have a showing that I will use later on. So in blue, uh, little blue are essentially molecules of water was a, is a schematic diagram, and in red are particles, which can be protein or can be anything else. And he says, well, if there is a continuous exchange of uh, a, a motion and energy between the particles that move and the molecule of the salt. And that uh, motion and that exchange of energy and, and momentum is what makes the particle move. And then, uh, he was very, very convincing in this proof, which was based on, on theory of gas. And, and then uh, people start to, to consider that not necessarily only living things will move, but also molecules will move as well. And that was known from the theory of gas. But let us see this drawing and what that means and what Einstein also observed. So uh, we can see that a motion which is similar to diffusion. For example, could occur if we have a particle that moves in a, in a potential. And simply the activation, so going to the next uh, a potential well and so on, will occur because you give some energy and that energy is given by the Boltzmann uh, distribution. But you can see that I can draw as well, uh, if I use this picture, a very deep uh, well and once a molecule gets in a very deep well, will take much longer time 
to get out of the deeper well and uh, perform what I will call apparent diffusion. And this is shown in this diagram in which a molecule maybe will stay in a well for some time and then once in a while will start in, in another, in going another well. So that means that actually the motion not always occur because of uh, all the wells are the same or all the jumps are the same, but in a, in a system which is complicated as it can be a cell, it's possible to have a chopping in one particular position, maybe a binding site, and then going to a different position and so on, but still is under the form of the exchange of energy with the medium, uh, with, with this cell. Okay, so let's go back to uh, uh, fluctuation spectroscopy and let us see who are the important people in this field. So as I said, uh, about 200 years ago, uh, was introduced the concept of Brownian motion and I can give an explanation about 100 years later. And, but at that time, the, there was a lot of interest in understanding noise. And uh, there was a noise in resistor, which is called Johnson noise. Uh, Nyquist uh, was a very important uh, contribution to that. And all the mathematics of uh, noise was developed around uh, 1920, uh, something like that, on the idea that uh, all objects, uh, including telegraph line and telephone lines, are subject to noise. And people study that noise uh, very careful, and they discover actually that no matter what they do, the noise was always present, and it was always present because it uh, was coming essentially from the cosmos, from, from the origin of the universe. And they discover in that way the origin of the universe just by studying the noise. So there were many other people who were interested in So let's go more modern. And uh, um, I have the name of Manfred, Manfred Eigen because Manfred Eigen uh, was uh, interested in the noise in chemical reaction, but from the point of view of single molecules. So how a chemical reaction occurs and what is why some reaction goes faster and goes slower uh, and so on. But it was really um, by the work of Elliot Elson, uh, in 1972 that he did the first FCS, which F type of fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. Today, we used the F for fluctuation correlation spectroscopy uh, because other objects can also, no, not necessarily is related to fluorescence. And so, uh, Elliot Elson wrote a famous paper in 1972. Uh, he's the first author with Doug Marte and World Web and is in a physics journal and in which he described the reaction of ethidium bromide with the DNA. So it's a chemical reaction and he studied the uh, time it takes for ethidium bromide to bind and to unbind and doing so study um, the, uh, part of, the part which is chemical reaction. And I have a, a picture of one of my students which is uh, Keith Berlin, he is now a professor in Emory and he was one of the first, actually, the first application of two photon uh, FCS in SATs. And uh, we have to wait a lot of time to have a commercial instrument that people can use in order to measure fluctuation. So there is, an, uh, there is another very important part of measuring diffusion, and I have the name of uh, Dan Axelrod and the picture of Dan Axelrod. And the other method, which is based on perturbation, and it's called a FRAP. FRAP stays for fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching. So you have a system of molecule. You can, by zapping with a laser, very high power, to destroy, for example, the fluorescence of the molecule. But due to the transport of molecule into that volume, you will recover part. Actually, part can be also not recoverable and so on. But in this experiment, uh, which is very nice and has a lot of success and a lot of people use, you don't, don't care about the single molecule, although the process is due to the single molecule. But uh, fluctuation spectroscopy cares about the single molecule, but cares in a different way and cares in the following way. So suppose we look at the same system and I dilute it a little bit so I have less molecule and then we observe a molecule. Uh, you observe a given volume. 
So for example, in this volume, I have one to three molecules, and then after some time, I can have two and so on. And, and uh, what is happening is that the average intensity will fluctuate if I measure a single point, I will fluctuate with the given rules, which are given by, by the way I observe the volume and by the transport that the, the equation of transport that will bring the molecules in that volume. And now you can see that here I put the accent on single molecule and not here, which can very well be a, a concentration of molecules. Okay, so uh, let us start, talk about this number fluctuation because this is uh, crucial to understand FCS in general. So the number, uh, the number fluctuation says that uh, the basic idea is that any open volume, so a volume which is connected to a reservoir where it's very large compared to the volume I'm observing, the number of molecules or particles fluctuate according to a Poisson statistics. Of course, if the particles are not interacting. So in a, in a given volume, I can observe three, five, one, two, four, whatever, a sequence. So if I'm able to observe a, a single volume, I can observe molecules going in and out of that volume. And uh, since the distribution, the spectral distribution due to chemical physics uh, reason is Poissonian, the average number will depend on the concentration of the particle. So uh, the Poisson distribution is a distribution in which the variance is equal to the number of particles in the volume. And, but this principle, which is the occupation number, doesn't tell anything about the time it will, a fluctuation will stay there. And so let's go to the next step. So in comparing, in comparing FRAP, in which we have a system at equilibrium, which is indicated by this line, uh, the system can be out of equilibrium, positive or negative, it doesn't matter, and then recover to equilibrium with the given law. In FCS, also we observe a system at equilibrium, which is that line, and which is exactly the same value, the average value. But the fluctuations occur, positive or negative, and uh, that fluctuation occurs because simply uh, molecules can go in and out the observation volume. And while here, we have effects which are synchronized in time. Here we have all the effects which are not synchronized in time. And this is very important because we have to find the mathematics, a way in which we can see all those uh, fluctuations, put them together and compare with the fluctuation that we expect if we can synchronize it. Of course, in a, in a system which is spontaneous fluctuation, by being spontaneous, there is no way we will know when the spontaneous fluctuation will increase, will be high or low and so on. So we need a special mathematics. And that mathematics was developed around 1930, 1940, to explain uh, noise in general. Okay, so this is a, a famous experiment done by Spetsberg. And uh, uh, I copied this table, which is in the first page of, uh, of the paper. And uh, this, uh, of, this observation was done by what what Svedberg called ultra microscope. Today we will call a spin microscope, uh, in which a, a, a sheet of light was illuminating um, a solution which contains gold particles, and he was looking with the eyes and dictating the number of particles he can see every uh, every second. Actually, it has a metronome that was was uh, uh, scanning the second. So, and he was saying, I see two one, two, zero, zero, so no particle, two particle, zero, zero, one, three, two, and so on, and so on, and then he stopped. He stopped because he was silent to, to count the particle and dictating, and then he started all over again. And that was a, a clearly great observation because if this is a total random se sequence, you can stop and start all over again, and you can see all the points where uh, that stop. And that is important because the fluctuation in this case, you see one, two, zero, zero, where counting the particles, in that case, gigantic particles, a uh, golden nanoparticle, that he was observing in the microscope. Uh, but that gives you an idea that uh, the fluctuation is given by, by particle of molecules, as we call. Now, this is the same graph uh, in this page that I 
draw again using Excel or using any, any software. And now, if you look at this part, at this graph, which is the same sequence I have there, which is, I would say, it's the raw data, but it's irrepeatable because it's random data. I observe something which is, that is, there is no word in this Velvet paper, that there is something strange about this sequence. So you see, more or less the average value can be between two and three. But then once in a while you get the fluctuation which is much larger, and once in a while you get nothing. And if the system will fluctuate randomly, why, how come that for a long period of time I never see zero particle and so on. So uh, if you actually look more in, in detail, you will see that there is like a, a fluctuation in the number of particles and here and here and here and so on. So this intensity that uh, I draw here from the data of Zwerzberg, Zwerzberg didn't pay any attention to that. Otherwise, my BFCS would have been discovered very, very earlier, uh, much earlier. But it contains all the information I want to do. And actually, this is a very simple experiment for those of you who are interested in teaching that can be for teaching fluctuation in a system. And uh, of course, you know, you have the average number and he plot the uh, Poisson distribution. So how many times I observe a given number, number of particles, zero, one, two, three, four, five. And he demonstrated that actually the occupation number follows the Poisson distribution, fine. But he didn't observe that the relaxation time. So that in order to change the number of particles, uh, he has to calculate something different, something which is related to the, essentially, the average of this curve, which we learn to do, and that is called a, a correlation function. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, observation of single molecules. So what can cause the fluctuation in the fluorescence signal? Well, clearly, the number of molecules in the fluorescence volume, as I say, and that will change due to diffusion or binding if the particles get correlated and they don't move or they move all together. Then, of course, uh, uh, for example, conformational dynamics, you have seen that the spectrum of the protein can change very much depending on the conformation of the, of the protein itself. So conformation can be the origin of fluctuation. Rotational motion, if polarized or is either in excitation or emission, can also give fluctuation. And then finally, I have Protein folding, uh, folding blinking, which becomes very, very important today for su super resolution, and many other things that can be directly observed in FCS. Okay, so let us focus on one particular thing, which is let us suppose that we have a volume of observation, which is, which is very important, how that volume of observation can be obtained. We have molecules which are going in, in a Brownian motion, random motion, and once in a while, a molecule will cross the volume of observation. Well, when it cross the volume of observation, will produce a signal that we will observe. Notice that this signal can be scattering, can be anything, doesn't need to be fluorescent, but it generates a signal. And, and then we will see the changes in, in, in intensity measured by a microscope in that particular volume. So the important thing here is the volume. How of course, the smaller is the volume, the larger will be the fluctuation. And most of the time, if the volume is very small, no molecules or no molecules that we want to measure will occupy that volume. So this comes to the one photon and two photon. I will not spend any time here, but just to explain that in one photon, we can have a confocal volume, which was the first one used by Manfred Eigen and Rudolf uh, Riegler in order to uh, describe this process. But today we can do in another way, which is using two photon excitation, in which case you have seen that the uh, um, emission of fluorescence can come from a very small point. So I will not go through that because we already did that. But I want to, to stop in this part and to point out why it took so long from Svetberg or let us say from, from uh, 200 years ago, Brownian, uh, uh, Robert Brown, to observe those, those fluctuations. So suppose we have a, a millimeter volume, which is a cuvette, and 
my standard is one micromolar solution uh, of most molecule, small molecule that will be important in, in water. So in a millimeter cuvette, uh, which is a millimeter, so one millimeter by one millimeter order of, of size, okay, uh, well, this is 10 millimeter actually, is we have on the order, if we have one micromolar, we have on the order of 10 to the 14 molecules. Six uh, times 10 to the 14 molecules, which is a very large number. So it will be very, 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 very difficult to see any fluctuation. But the other important thing is that the time it takes a molecule to cross a, to, uh, cross a volume of the order of uh, uh, 10 millimeter is on the order of 10 to the fourth second. So if you want to mix something in a cuvette, uh, shake it because otherwise it will take forever due to the fusion. Okay. Let's go immediately to a picoliter, which is a, a typical cell. So now we have, instead of a, a, the size of a typical cell, is let us say 10 micron. Of course, it's not a cube, but it's 10 micron. And now we have in that volume much less molecule. Uh, so something that might be we can start to measure. But the important thing is that it will take a, a much shorter time to cross that volume. So the shorter time can only be measured if you have a detector. The eye will not be sensitive to that. And then if we have in a confocal volume like we will deal, so it's about one micron by one micron by one micron, we have on the order, even at one micromolar, we have on the order of 100 molecules, or 600 molecules. But the time it will take to cross that volume is, is a fraction of a millisecond. And that is really a, a very small amount of time and we need very sensitive and fast detector in order to measure. So we need two technologies. One, how to create a, a volume which is small. And second, how to measure a, a fluctuation which is very fast. And, and that took some time and uh, only in the end of the uh, previous century, we were able to have technology that I was able to measure. Okay, so how the signal appears and let us see what are the characteristics because this is really the important thing. So this is the same experiment that was done by Svelber, but we did now a much higher frequency. So the time is in microsecond, it didn't have a microsecond. And then when a particle will cross the volume, we will see a certain number of count, a certain number of count and so on. And uh, First of all, we can expand so we can zoom in one of those events and we can see that there is a duration. And what is the duration? So the duration, the average duration will be the average time a, a molecule occupies the volume of observation. And then there is a distribution of, in this case, of photon counts. And you see sometimes I will have maybe 100, sometimes I will have uh, 600 or 700 or whatever, 600. And, and you see that there is a distribution of amplitude. And that distribution of amplitude today we call the photon counting histogram. So it's essentially the histogram of the uh, values you, you, you see here, which give us information. So about, about what? About the time it takes the, the molecules to give a, a to, to, to pass to the volume, but will give also about the number n of the molecules that we have, and also about the, the uh, time it will take, so the distribution of time. So the distribution of time is measured by the uh, correlation function. So, but there are two quantities, and I will not uh, 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 discuss today the amplitude of the fluctuation, but I will discuss only the duration of the fluctuation. The amplitude of the fluctuation goes under, uh, it's like under the name of photon counting histogram or also NMB in the case of cell, and it will be discussed in other lectures. Okay, but let us talk about the duration. So we have fluctuation, that was the average, and those are the fluctuation, and we need to know how long a fluctuation which is high will go to low or which is low to go to high. And we build this quantity, which is called the correlation function. The correlation function depends on the 
uh, how far to, uh, an event in time we measure or we correlate and we take the fluctuation of the uh, respect to the uh, average value of the, of the, of the um, flu, uh, fluorescence, we multiply by the value of the fluorescence at the given distance so that if that is negative and that is positive, will be the same if that is positive and that is negative. And then we normalize, this is a very important thing, uh, to the average value. So we divide by the average value of the square. And that is a quantity. If you see, you have an F here, an F here, an F to the square here. So it's independent on the unit that we use to measure fluorescence. And is called the correlation function. The correlation function, so a time when the time is very zero, is called the G0, the G at time zero, which is essentially the variance divided the average, which will be equal to one for the Poisson distribution. Or otherwise, at very long time, we will always go to zero because the fluctuation which occurs in this point, if we look at the very far point, will be uncorrelated. Okay, so now we need to express the fluorescence in terms of some general model. And let us see what is happening here. So we say that the fluorescence is given by the product of observation parameter, how good is the filter, how much you illuminate, and the quantum mill. Of course, if the quantum mill is zero, there is no fluorescence. Then we have another part, which is a part which is uh, uh, given by the, how the volume is excited, and how the concentration of molecule or the number of molecules change in that volume. And of course, now you can see that that part is, is essentially a common factor. This is the illumination volume. So everything depends on the illumination volume and where the molecules are in the uh, uh, illumination volume. So that is very important. And that is one of the problems with FCS that we will discuss later on. Okay. So what is the excitation volume? So in, in, the, in, in this plane, okay, what we call the XY, the XY plane, so the light is coming in this direction, uh, the illumination volume is always Gaussian, or approximate by Gaussian, of course it will be the Airy function. And uh, uh, it's actually not written as a Gaussian, but it's written as, because in a, in a true Gaussian that will be true here, and then we have a quantity we call the waste of the, um, uh, of the illumination volume. And then the Z, which is different, if we have a, a essential a, a confocal system, we have a two photon system. So if we have a confocal system, then also in the Z is exponential, or, or it's Gaussian. But uh, uh, if you have a, a two photon system illumination that is a polynomial so it's divided by a polynomial so that decreases much uh, less uh, as a function of z that decrease in the other way so uh, and that comes from the fact that the intensity along the z is square because of the we have two photon excitation so all the out correlation function well not all as i will show in the application uh, later on today uh, it starts from a value that actually, this is a log scale and the value is not defined because you, you will have to, to go to zero and zero does not, does not exist in there. So we say that this is the limiting value, we call G zero the limiting value of the fluctuation. And what happens is that the limiting value of the amplitude of the fluctuation is proportional to one over n, where n is the number of particles. And this is, of course, a very interesting point. Okay. Um, so, uh, then has a value, since it goes from high to low, where it costs the one half, and this is called the correlation, the characteristic correlation time of the fluctuation, and then it has to go to zero. If it doesn't go to zero, that means that we never reach equilibrium, which is also a very important thing. So, this is the correlation function. And the correlation function, uh, how, how come that the correlation function gives uh, a, a information about the number of particles? So let us make the reasoning on, in terms of molecules that we have in a volume. So 
Suppose we have two molecules in the volume of excitation and one goes in, so the change will be 50% because the intensity will stay a one, whatever, and one was lost. Okay, fine. Suppose we have four and one leaves the excitation volume. Well, the intensity total at a time t equal to zero will change by 25% and so on. So you can see if we have 100 and one leaves, it will be one per 100. If we have 1,000 and one moves out or in, we will, give one, we will get the fluctuation, which is one per, per, per thousand. So that means that the, the G0 the, give us directly the information about the number of particles. And this is very important because we can place our observation volume in the nucleus or in the mitochondria or any other place in the cell. And everyone in the world we should obtain for the same uh, system the same number of particles. And so this is a way to measure a number of particles, not necessarily concentration, but is universal and is applied and is a, a, a consequence of the fluctuation. So that demonstration can also be done mathematically, uh, where if we know that the average is equal to the variance, I will not go through that because it's in the notes here. And you can show that the, the G0, so this value of the G0 is proportional to one over n average. So this is what we want to say. Well, uh, this is not exactly correct because the volume of excitation as I show uh, here is not, is not sharp. So you can see that the volume of excitation is uh, a Gaussian distribution. So a point at the center will have more intensity than the point at the periphery of the point of excitation. And that gives rise to a, a factor we have to take into account, which depends on where the particle is in the volume of excitation. And that factor we call gamma, which simply depends how steep is the volume of excitation. So in general, we have the following expression, which under uh, the diffusion, uh, under uh, takes this um, expression. So if we have diffusion, uh, and this is the two photon equation will have a night here, uh, is proportion to, always proportion to the inverse of the number of molecules to the gamma factor. And then for each dimension, we'll have a terms of, uh, which is due to diffusion, which is two minus one. So for example, for a three dimension, we have minus one and then minus one half. So that, that will give the, and this comes directly from the Gaussian thing. And uh, so, uh, so this, this is a very general solution. The other thing I want to show you here that uh, uh, what happens if you have different processes? And this is very important, for, for example, because today we use molecules that are strongly blink, blinking and also are diffusion, diffusing, and how we can separate the two of them. Well, uh, there is a, a, a general theorem that says that the correlation function is the product of the cover of single correlation function for the different process if the process are independent. For example, if the molecule uh, blinks and diffuses at the same time, but the diffusion is independent of the fact that the molecule is blinking or not, and the molecule keep diffusing if it's uh, uh, giving light or not, then we can split the total correlation function in the product of two. And then we can add a three or four, four, five, six, what are processes? And fortunately, in the programs we have today, you choose to uh, uh, associate to the analysis what are the processes that you want to have. And the, from the point of view of the computer, it's very, very easy because you have diffusion, you have blinking, or, or any other thing. And for example, here we have the blinking terms, which is used today uh, under some assumption. Okay, so now uh, clearly blinking or binding are similar effect. In fact, I call blinking and binding here with the same name. Now, how different is a correlation function if you have diffusion and or you have this binding only term, which is an exponential as a function of time? Well, you say diffusion is a polynomial and here is exponential. 
is supposed to be very different. Well, no, it is different, but not enormously different. So for example, suppose they read a real experiment, the beta, and you have pure diffusion, so that will be the fit of the diffusion, which will be something like that here. And then you have an exponential term, what well, would be that one? Yes, it is different, of course, but that difference, if you have noise in the measurement, would be very difficult to, to, to study. And so we need different methods we will discuss later. Okay, so first of all, how different are the correlation function? So if you have a molecule, a small molecule with diffusing water, for example, with a diffusion coefficient of 300 micrometers square per second, you will get something like that. So if you have a molecule with the size of GFP, which diffuse freely in solution, you have 90. So that is a very large difference and you will be able to make. But if you have a dimer of, uh, so a two protein in such a way that uh, you have a dimer, the difference is very, very small. So it will be very difficult to, to distinguish that. And this is due to the fact that the diffusion of molecule according to the stock einstein equation depends of course on temperature, on the inverse of the viscosity, but it depends on the radius of the molecule. And the radius of the molecule uh, depends, well, the volume of a dimer will be twice the volume of a, of a monomer, but that depends on the cube of the, of the uh, radius. So the difference between a monomer and a dimer would be two to one third, which is a very small difference, which is exactly the difference I showed here. Okay. So let us uh, have some data in order to see how things are and what other points we want to mention in this introductory lecture. So those are HeLa cells, which are expressing a, a protein, which is a DNA kinase EGFP in a console with GFB. And uh, you see th those are two cells and uh, uh, we have a, a mutant of a, well, it's not a mutant, a, another form of a, um, adenyl kinase, uh, which is called adenyl kinase 1, 1 beta, which has a, a, a signal to bind to a membrane of the cell. And then you can see that very well how it binds to the membrane of the cell. So let us follow this table because this table is, is very important to understand many of the things. So from the point of view of uh, uh, molecules, a EGFP in solution will have an average time, will transit time on the order between 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minus two cell. But if the same molecule is in the cell, so EGFP is in the cell, it changes by a huge amount. And, but this is also monomeric, and this is monomeric, and it changes by a huge amount. And then you can add mass by a, a difference. So the question is why why a molecule in solution will move much faster than the molecule in cell, in a cell. And people say, well, it's due to the fact that the cell have viscosity. Well, that contradicts the principle that we, we and other people have measured, that if you measure the rotational rate of a molecule in solution or in a cell, it's about the same. So how can be that the diffusion, translational diffusion, is so different than the rotational diffusion. So the rotational diffusion is the same, but the translation is very different. So something has to be very wrong about what I say. And what is wrong is essentially that I assume that the cell is a uniform space where there are no barriers, or there are no or obstacle to motion. And then uh, translation and rotation uh, I assume every change in the translation to uh, the, the so-called general viscosity of the cell. And that was a concept that was, for a long time, was, uh, everybody was using this concept, but clearly there is something completely wrong about this concept. And uh, if we have time, we will discuss what is wrong and, uh, and uh, so how come that they, um, diffusion is so different than the translation. So at this point, I will go uh, rapidly through other observation that if you measure, for example, this is the membrane of the cell and you measure the diffusion here and then you measure the diffusion in different parts of the cell, 
you will measure very different uh, diffusion coefficient. So here will be, well, here is twice because uh, there are two values, one for motion in the, in the membrane and motion uh, in the volume of suffered in, in the cell. But you can see that those values change by more than a factor of two. And there is no, it's not an error in the measure. They really change more than a factor of two. Uh, and the reason is because the cell is very different. The, the motion of a, the same molecule in different parts of the cell is very different. So now we, we end up with a way to specially resolve the motion of the, that we need in order to specially resolve the motion of the cell in order to have uh, uh, information about what is happening in the cell interior. Uh, before I uh, stop this part, I will talk very, very briefly about uh, um, two-channel detection of cross-correlation. So for example, if you have a given molecule in a given volume, and just use a beam splitter, so you still observe the same molecule, but in two detectors separately, all the fluctuations of the molecules will be independent of the fluctuations that are due to the detector. So, Hello? Okay, so in the, in the detector side, uh, you will observe some motion due to the molecule, detector one and detector two. But you do the cross correlation, you decrease uh, effects which are due to the detector itself. And this is uh, what was called the after pulsing, and uh, Lionel briefly said that they have detectors that have no after pulse. So how you treat the cross correlation? Well, the cross correlation, you simply cross correlate the a fluctuation in one channel with the fluctuation in the other. And you call cross correlation the, the cross product of the, of the various uh, things. And uh, so the equations are identical, the same, but you, have, uh, you are able to separate colors. For example, if instead of using a beam splitter, you use a color filter that separate, for example, the red molecules from the green molecules. And then you can only observe the ones that are common, which will be the ones that have two colors. So green and red and green and red. And in that way, it's possible to increase the sensitivity of the method only to the system that carries both colors at the same time. That can be done much better uh, using other techniques that were worked out in my lab by Don Lamb when Don Lamb was working in my lab using exci simultaneous excitation is not only excite everything, but also excite only the groups which are of the molecule which have two color, and that improves the signal to resolution. So I want to go to the end of this part, uh, which is uh, a very important concept, which has to do with what you observe in the cross correlation. And I have this slide because uh, some of the software sold by, by commercial software make a, 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 an error in a, a interpreting what happens in the cross correlation. And the error is based on the fact that they say, well, the cross correlation measure only the molecules which are two colors. So therefore, you can measure the concentration of those molecules. Well, this is wrong, and this is wrong for the following reason. Uh, so this is a simulation, but pay attention to the value. So suppose in channel one, which is green, for example, I observe a, a water, 100 molecules, which are only green, so they are not in channel two. And then in channel two, I observe 50, but the molecules which are together is, uh, are observed with, this, with, for example, 20 in this channel and 20 in the other. So what I measure, the following thing. So if I measure the cross correlation in channel one, I will have 120 molecules, 100 here and 20 there. The correlation in channel two will be 50. So it's total seven. So that will be the channel one, well, and that will be the channel two because we will have less. The cross correlation can never be larger than the autocorrelation. Okay, no matter how many molecules you have, cannot be larger. So always will be lower, and the cross correlation will be the fraction of molecules with respect to the channel red or to the channel green. 
So this is what you mentioned. You have to be very careful because I said there is software sold by companies, whatever, that they say that this is a concentration. Well, this is not a concentration. This is the fraction of molecule to respect to the total you have in a chunk. So this is important and, uh, and it's something that can be done by everyone and figure out what it is. So I will end up with some questions which might be can give rise to the beginning of a discussion. And I discussed the PSF and I show the point spread function and I discussed that the volume of illumination uh, makes the diffusion coefficient to change because it uh, affects the diffusion coefficient. Then I discuss only model for diffusion and not, for example, model for anomalous diffusion, which we can say where it will come from. Uh, we see that we can see binding under some particular condition. What happens if we have fat? So, so this is a question maybe somebody will have. And what, hap what happens if we have bleaching in the sample? Those are the most common question I have when I finish this lecture of the general ideas about the seed. Before I conclude, I want to stress that I focus on single molecule, on the idea that FCS gives us a chance to observe single molecule. And we will see in the rest of the talk I will give, I will always use this concept that we are observing single molecule and we have observing the properties of single molecule. It can be one color, can be another, can be moving in a very complicated geometry, in channels, in the presence of membrane and other things like that. And this is still a problem that since the, since the, 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 bound, the boundaries for motion of a molecules in a cell are very complicated, maybe we will never finish to solve it. But we have to be aware that the motion depends on the geometry of the surrounding space. So I will stop here and I will open the floor for discussion.